And welcome to this midweek edition of the Rugby Bits podcast. I'm here with Sean. I'm Tala. We're going to talk about the second week of the Rugby Championship. Now that we have all the sides out, we're going to preview Australia versus the African in, in Perth and New Zealand versus Argentina in Auckland. So, Sean, we now have an Australian squad that came out, a lot more experienced team than the team that played last week. Um, the likes of Marika Korobete have come back, Nick White. Um, Angus Bell is going to fortify the scrum as well. I think just as a point of departure, this is a better team than last week, is it? Yeah, 100%. Uh, Hightala and everyone. Definitely, I, I looked at that side and I was like, nah, the nerves have kicked in. Um, <laughs> it's, uh, it's a side that that is definitely one of the better ones, something that we probably thought we'd see in the opening uh, game. But coupled with the fact that we've made so many changes. Um, all the fans want to come away from Australia 2-0, uh, breaking records by, I think this is the first ever time that we would have won uh, in three consecutive times on Australian soil against the Wallabies. So, yeah, good side. Um, and I'm interested to see what uh, what Saturday brings. But the nerves are here for sure. Yeah. So Australia, ironically enough, has also made 10 changes to their team. Um, as Disrespectful. The <laughs> um, so including the people I've talked about, um, Angus Blythe is in for um, the concussed um, Nick Frost. Um, we have, um, we also have um, in the bench, there's a lot of changes with um, Tom Hooper coming in, Seru Uru can, could make a, a debut, Ben Donaldson is in for Tom Liner, and Max Jorges, Jorgensen um, is in um, in the 23. Sean, in terms of the big experience players, obviously White has been playing super rugby, but Corvette has been away, and Bell also has been, well, Corvette has been away in Japan, I should say, and Bell has been injured. Is there a worry that you would have if you're Australian that they might be a bit rusty? Nah, I think, I think the thing about Coro Betty, he's ridiculously hard. He runs really, really strong. Um, I, I think he'll be okay. And the fact, if there were was a little bit of rust there, it was worked off last week. Uh, Joe Schmidt said that he wanted Coro Betty to spend another week in, in camp before playing him. That's why he didn't play last week. So you'd think everything's a little bit uh, like sort of sorted out. Angus Bell... I know that he's coming back from injury. I just think he's a great operator. I think what he does to that front row is it's not just a, a one-man change. Like he will elevate Alatoa, Al Alatoa as well. Uh, that's how I see it. I, I think that like they'll both balance each other out really well, do do good, like do some good stuff at scrum time. I don't think it's going to be such a massive walkover. So Bell's huge for me. Um, and then obviously they got Slipper and Nongo coming off the bench. Like, I don't know. I'm not, I don't know about Nongo yet. And I think that's just probably because I haven't watched enough of him. Like he's a massive, mm. massive guy. He seems to handle himself well around the park. He's got some decent hands from what I've seen. Um, so I think they're okay up front and it really feels that they need to start there. Like first and foremost, start with that front row and that tight five just to settle things like even if they're not going to get parity later on like if they just sure things up for the first two or three scrums perception of the whole team and the match day 23 change like they're like oh we're in this yeah and perception also for the ref if the first two or three scrums aren't tracking all the way backwards to sydney um <laughs> looking at the position groups it's i mean even though this is effectively a second string south african team it's not like there's a big like quality gap or even experience gap between the two sides. I mean, yes, probably in the front row, you could say, but someone like Thomas Dutoy has played obviously a ton of rugby at just the level below test rugby gives at least some assurance that, you know, he can help to withstand any of the pressures that um, will come from, from the Aussie front row. But for everywhere else, you might even argue that the South Africans have the advantage like at locks, um, it's probably a, a close to a draw if you consider Nokia and Morat have don't have too many test caps and Blythe and Salakai Loto. I mean, Elisa hasn't played too much lock, so there's almost an experience there. Loose forwards, I think, is probably advantage South Africa if you consider Eric Lowe's obviously on 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 a, on form. There's still that Peter Steph to toy, 
So it's not like there's a there's too many big areas. I think the one area would be Al Alatoa has to almost not retire. That's a bit dramatic, but he has to cook Jan Hendrik vessels. Yeah. It's interesting, like you look at those those groups in isolation and you can kind of get away with saying, you know, there's a little bit of experience here and there. But I'm also a big fan in in if you look next to you, either side of you, do you have some experience? And there are a couple of gaps in that space. Um, like with Thomas de Toy, really the only super experienced one in that tight five. Um, you know, there's two guys either side of him, but obviously Ruan Yokir and um and Salma Murats have have got the lustria to look through, look forward to. It's, I think it's not about, we, Rusty Rasmus, Jacques Ninaba, and all of those that have come since 2019 or 2018 when they took over, have we've, they've taught us that we must just go there and F them up physically in the pack. Like, and that's that <laughs> scrum time. Like you just go and you scrum them and you just destroy them. I, I don't think that's going to be the case for the Wallabies. I think the Wallabies are going to be about just managing that initial space specifically at scrum time. Like yeah. if you can get a little bit of go forward, then go for it, but don't go there to knock the guy out of his boots or retire him or whatever. I think it's really a case of let's just show that we will be competitive and that will change. Like they will grow within themselves as a team. If after that first scrum, they managed, everything's fine. Like it was one of those scrums that is just dead, dead center, 50, 50, then they'll be like, okay, cool. Now we can start planning and prepping for our strike. And let's have a look and feel at how, how the props in their front row are operating. You know, you do work out where the, where the weaknesses are when they're there. And then you work as a team together, a little team chat for a, some sore ribs and, a, and some water. And then you tell the boys, listen, right, this is where there's a break in the seam. Let's focus on that. Yeah. And then on the back line, um, you know, obviously we talked on Monday's part about, or Tuesday's part about, you know, the struggles that Noel Lolasio has. We've talked about nine. So obviously White and Lolasio, they played a lot together when White was at the Brumby. So at least there's some experience there. I'm quite interested in the Lucanio Arm center or inside center experiment, especially with Hunter Paisami. He's a, he's almost... 20 years later, David Barry, like he goes into every type of contact he wants to, and he's just trying to make an impact when he does that. He flies into every tackle. He flies when he has the ball. Like he's that sort of like classical inside center. And not that Lucanio, I'm um, obviously he can more than withstand something like that, but it'll be interesting in terms of style. And I'm wondering even with the Springbok defense with, you know, two essential, essentially two 13s, obviously two very experienced 13s, um, in their centers, will it almost go into like almost like an uber rush defense where both of them are almost shooting up and trying to close the space? You, you, you'd think maybe that might be a way of putting Lolosia under pressure because he's maybe still finding himself and not too sure about you know how he wants to play. So if you just limit his space and the ball isn't getting to Ikitao or Kellaway or Korobete, then it, it it becomes a very long day for him. Yeah, it's such an interesting call seeing Armand Creel in the midfield. Um, you would think that he has been defending up against uh, Lendi and Esther Hazen for some time in camp now. Like they would have hoped to have worked that out. Um, I'm I'm super, this is one of the things I'm super excited for. Like if you took us back to any time and this this team, well, this mid at uh, 213s were named, you'd just be like, what on earth is going on? But now it's exciting. And I think that's, probably credit to Rossi and he's got a, a lot in the bank. He's allowed to check out some things. The big thing I think is to give, um, like we're also about building squad depth so you can give people some breaks. So Damien Delaney gets a break now. Um, Billy LaRue gets a break because Fussy's in form. But defensively, I'm very interested. And I don't know, like the thing is, one thing about Lolisio is, He's only really got to keep an eye on on uh, out for Marco von Staden. Like it's not, you know, he doesn't have to worry about the Lendi or Estazen coming in and smoking him. Like there's that, mm. but it's going to be very interesting how that gets managed. And I'd love to see. It all really hinges on on what the game plan is for Lukanya Um. Like he's got to be playing at his strengths. Um, obviously not completely out, outside of his wheelhouse. He's got to be in it. I mean, when he broke out, when he was playing pro rugby, he was playing 12. So he's not far into the position, but like 
Portugal aside, he hasn't played 12. Um, uh, well, he's played for the Sharks, but he hasn't played for the Springboks. So, like, it's it's going to be interesting. And I'm excited to see it. And it'll be fun. I mean, if both him and Creel are coming up, you must understand is Creel's also a massive spot tackler, like outside and inside. So Creel could shift into 12 and I could go to 13 on defense and attack. Like, I, I see that happening a couple times. I think they can both kind of swap around. But it's probably more about um playing more at 12 because that's going to extend his space moving forward. It'll also allow us to name just three midfielders in squads moving forward because I'm can cover both. Delendi can cover 12 and 13 and I'm so outright 13 and covers wing, you know, so it's good. It's going to be exciting. And are we in for a, a new look defensive setup? Like, is this Jerry's time to implement what he wants? Mm. It's going to be very interesting. I think we can see that, even with last week, not that I mean I don't think there's been too many big changes to the Ninaba, um, uh, you know, plan. But last week, you as we talked about on Tuesday, like the defense was on form, like it was really shutting things down. It barely gave Australia a sniff. It, I mean, never mind a line break; they weren't really getting any too many opportunities to score. So that hopefully is something to build on and hopefully that this new team or essentially a new team they can sort of build on that and say look when when you get the opportunity to sort of put someone back and smoke them do it and then obviously the momentum just builds from there and I think for the Wallabies they have to I think the likes of Paisami, Wilson, Valentini, um, Salakai Loto when Uru comes on as well I'm surprised Uru has not made a day de- has not debuted for the Wallabies. I thought he had about five caps already. Yeah, I, I was actually I was thinking that when I saw he was on debut, I was like, I really expected the sooner. Um, you mm-hmm. know, maybe uh, I think in back of my head I was expecting it more um against Wales, like definitely earlier this year. But he's he's proper as well. And uh on debut, like coming out with a point to prove. Um, especially with what happened last week, I think it's a great opportunity and probably the perfect setup for him. Mm. Yeah. So, th- but yeah, I think my point was going to be that these big ball carriers really need to make an impact. Like, this needs to be like one of Paisami's best test matches. It needs to be a test match where he puts some pause into sort of the Springboks choosing I'm at 12 and just being like, well, you know what, I'm Sasha, whatever, I'm going to sort of track and get over the advantage line and set a platform because that really happened for the Wallabies on, on last week, Saturday. And then from there, we know that the Callaways, the Corabetes, the Tom Wrights, they are good lethal finishers. They just need an opportunity and those really weren't coming on, on Saturday. So it's a big opportunity and a big game for those ball carriers. Just um, on that, like, I'm very interested to see how um handles those those crash balls and stuff. I think they are 100% going to be running down his channel. Um, we've seen that Feinberg and Gromazun is pretty decent on defense. So they're going to want to try and get in between um, Sasha and Lucano. I think that's where it is. Um, they can If they go further out to Jesse Creel's space, I think that Creel will come cut in and just smoke guys. So very interested there. Um, the angle at which your defense... Um, well, the angle at which the players come in at you while you're defending at 12 is massively different to the way it is at 13. Lukanya M is a big guy, um, but that's going to be in your face defense. And I definitely see them targeting him a couple times, like straight over the top of a lineup. They're going to be straight sending a big boy down straight at his channel. And he just puts the first two guys down, stops them. And uh, we, we snap a turnover like we're golden then changes everything that they need to do yeah i can also expect i think we can also expect a joe schmidt like set piece special type move and having corabete also going into the guts there because obviously he's he's probably the biggest boy (laughs) to to expect there he's so big I, i think nick white's was chatting earlier a couple of guys were chatting and some media came out and they just said he's like so good to have him back he's made of granite and you honestly can see why they're saying it. You can just see it by the way he's built. Um, but he loves contact as well. He absolutely loves it. It's uh, we've mm. now got two two wingers on the field that love taking contact in uh, in Mapimpi and Korobeti, where previously, like last week, we had wingers <laughs> that want to avoid it at all costs. So it's uh, it's going to be a great change. Yeah, and I mean, 
this is the undercard. I mean, we have a big URC match happening, but probably the big heavyweight battle this weekend is Mapimbi versus Korobete. Oh, man, it has been spiced up. That has been spiced up by the South Africans only. Like, they have just <laughs> been absolutely fueling that fire. They, uh, you know, there's like Zulugok's on about um, Mapimpi's second grade. And he is definitely not the first choice 11, but I think if he he if he had to ever play 11, which he's doing now, I think he'll do just fine. I think the swings and roundabouts of what we're winning and losing between the two are, are marginal, but there's some great opportunity to try different tactics with whether you have Aronso or Mapimpi. But then obviously there was that uh, that tackle, that try saving tackle that Korobetsi put in that like debated whether it was a shoulder charge or not. There was Mapimpi having a go after he did score a try. It's glorious. It's uh, <laughs> it's absolutely a game within a game and one that everyone's up to, up to watch for too. Like that's the thing. Like everyone wants to see one of them get their ball in hand and we're going to be like, right, this is what we came for. We came here for the test match and the win, but we want to see this uh, this battle first. Yeah. Okay, I think let's then move to the other game for the weekend, and that's obviously the All Blacks versus the Pumas at Eden Park. Let's start with the New Zealand team. Um, a few changes made by Scott Robertson. I think one was enforced, which was um, Ethan De Groot coming off for Tamati Williams. So he comes into the loose head, the young, massive loose head prop. And then many, in, let's call them interesting changes to the back line. And I'm sure, Sean, you have particular thoughts about the, the number 13 making a change and having Rico Ioanni come back. But yeah, the wings, both of the wings have changed. Um, Mark Talea's all for Caleb Clark. Um, Will Jordan's in for Sever Reese. Um, as I mentioned, um, Rico Ioanni's in for Anton Leonard-Brown, who probably was the, one of the best players. And then on the bench, Sam Kane comes on for um, Wallace Atiti. I think maybe in hindsight, the pick of Satiti was maybe on the assumption that the New Zealanders would be winning that game and have a bit of a buffer to then introduce Satiti. And obviously that didn't really happen. So yeah, it's, I am not, yeah, I think the first take is I'm not quite sure what Reyes is doing. Is he rotating? Is he dropping? Is this the best team? Does he not know what the best team is? I, I'm not a hundred percent sure. I think this is rotation, but I'm also not sure if it is because obviously you're not. This isn't the time to rotate as well because if this goes pear shaped and you lose the Eden Park record and if probably the the rugby championship as well on Saturday, then yeah, that's gonna put the pressure on him. Absolutely. This looks like he's just kind of poking around in the engine just to kind of see something. It's not, as you mm. say, it's not a rotation. It's not a full out like you were shit and now are dropped. It, it really looks like he's kind of poking around. The weird thing though, he's made so many changes in the back line that looks like it has to be a rotation space for me because the back line weren't the problem. Like that was no. the thing is they weren't, they weren't getting what they needed to get up front in order for the back line to do their things. Granted, there were a couple of areas in the back line and some of them were costly in terms of a try, but like, for me, Anton Leonard Brown, as you say, was probably one of the best players. Rico Ioani, and I know I talk a lot of shit about him because I don't think he's a world class thirteen. He's a world class attacker, though. That is one thing that we cannot take away from him. He's excellent. Caleb Clark, interesting. Will Jordan does well out the air. Um, does very well out the air. Like, you know, mm. you know, is there are there different tactics coming in? Um, so it's it's very interesting. Up front, they're going to have to do something. Argentina, we'll get onto them now, have also made a couple of changes, very interesting ones, which I'm so excited about because th that will that's going to change things. And I think what Scott expected was Argentina were going to really kind of go same, same, same. And this is what Felipe Contaponi is doing is he's he's bringing something different in. He's 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 moving the 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 focus points elsewhere. But yeah, the Sam Kane for me, I think should have started. I, I I don't remember the last time he came off the bench, but he's mm. he's really a kind of guy that slowly gets in. It's like a diesel engine, like just gets in the game, and then he just operates at his his eight out of ten, seven out of ten, whatever, and just does his does his things, does it, and he's not really an impact player per se. So I'm interested to see how they unleash him and and what they do in that situation. But yes, up front is where they struggled. And I think 
they are not going to have it their own way despite these changes. And it'll all come down to the back line and how they manage the attack because the Argentinians on attack in forwards and backs has been pretty exciting. Yeah. Look, I, I, I assume this week was just a, a horrible week for the forwards and Jason Ryan was pretty much sticking it into them and just saying, look, you need to be a lot better than you were last week. It's interesting because I think a lot of the talk I've seen has been about the All Blacks not having like big impactful ball carriers. And I mean, that's kind of the whole thing we've been talking about with their locks and flanks right now is, you know, especially now with no Scott Barrett, you know, you don't have Shannon Frizzell. Uh, we're still looking out for Finau and Black Adder to, and to provide to make their impact yet. Yeah, it's like th that isn't really happening. I mean, there is one big ball carrier that they didn't want to pick, but, you know, I don't want to talk about Hoskins Satuta right now. Um, he scored so, a try recently, yeah. a couple of days ago. Yeah, and he gave away one as well with oh, the best that. way to be fair to him. Yeah, but I think it's interesting. I, I'm 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 wondering if you know. Yes, there wasn't change to the forwards, but what changes could he have made? I mean, there's not too much. Like they have a bit of a, an injury crisis, especially at lock. They don't have too many options in a loose trio that aren't like completely green. There isn't that many things that I guess um, Razor could have done there. You're right. It's not. I think bringing Williams on is 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 probably the only real move he could have made. Um, you know, he's Tamara Williams is is a a massive massive guy, and it's really about just working with Vi, Derry, Blackadder, and Papa Ali'i about how you want them to operate. I think it's really mm -hmm. about just polishing that because you want to do what you need to do in order to. Artie's got work to do, but you want to do as much as you can to give Artie a little something. The thing is, is yeah. he 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 operates so well uh, off script. Um, everyone has a script on the rugby field, but there's certain guys that you like. Cool when the opportunities on go, and everyone knows to go with you. And he he's like that on attack and defense. Like he he really he's got turnovers in him. He's got big hits in him. He's got a lot of things. Um, and it's really about sorting out like four, five, six, and seven. Just really like they've just got to know their game plan and what the, what the options are in their sleep they've really got to just settle down and just do the absolute basics properly because if you have your whole front row your whole pack doing the basics and Adi Savir on half script you are really in a good space um and they almost have to go down to that because they struggled with out with 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 all the fast ball that happened I mean on the breakdown, they spoke about how they need scrums and how they need this and how they need that. And oh my, how the mighty have fallen. And uh, like New Zealand, they need that desperately. They they need to really just dumb it down a little bit, allow the backs to do it. Because if they have 20 minutes of, of really just settling into the game, settling themselves down, it, you might not see it on the scoreboard or with line breaks, but the players as individuals will sort of gain that belief and momentum. And then they will start cracking it on when they need. Yeah. I don't know if you remember, Sean, was it two years ago? I think it was when one of the times the Blues made a big run into trying to win Super Rugby. And obviously they got thought by the Crusaders later, but it was the year when the Blues really said, okay, we have the best pack in Super Rugby. Like, let's use that. So they were, I think, like near the top for rolling malls. Their scrum was brilliant. They were good at the pick up and go and they were good at the physical stuff. And then people were like, yeah, they, they play a lot like South Africa. And the Blues got so offended with that. They were like, no, we're not anything like South Africa. We're different, all that sort of stuff. And I think... And I think I said this on Tuesday as well. The quicker New Zealand realizes that their strength is like they're not going to be sort of this off the cuff team as much as they almost have to build the platform, like you said, for then the brilliance and the magic of the Saviers and the Jordans to come into the game now. Like this has to be a game where they kick well instead of playing all of their rugby sort of in between the 10 meter lines. They need to kick and get into the Argentine territory. They need to hopefully get lineouts in there in, in the Argentine half, get the rolling ball going, get 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 the pick up and go um, um game going, and really put Argentina under pressure there. And then you can suck people in. Obviously, once you have that, the DMAX and the Bowdens are going to be able to 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 exploit those opportunities. Like I think they're almost skipping steps with how they're playing. Like they're trying to to keep the ball in hand, to pass a lot, and it's not gonna happen for them. Like they don't have, 
you know, the, the gap is obviously, as we've talked about for a few years now, the gap is closed, I think, in terms of talent. But also, you kind of now have the forwards to be a bit more sort of like tighter and uncompromising and bring people in and then spread it out. Like, they need to build the innings there. 100%. You've hit the nail on the head. And if you look at, like, you talk about, like, throwing it around and all that, and everyone will automatically kind of kick back to the, 2010s uh that that all black side um you know the guys were throwing it around for fun what what i found bonkers about like ex like pros and coaches in the new zealand in kiwis like talking about like that sort of stuff and forgetting that the all blacks had a dominant scrum they were the tightest mm. on defense and they had a very good line out and then they threw it around and many years ago i said like they defend for work and the attack is the reward they get afterwards. And they've stopped, they've stopped that now. Like they've they've either taken their eye off that and just figured it'll it'll rectify itself. And maybe now mm. that they need to just absolutely be focusing on it, it has to be a thing. If you look at how long it took the Springboks to get to where they are now, it's been a really long journey. Like it's been a long journey since 2018 to get you now where we're not we're dominating at scrum time if we want to name if we're playing in a wet weather at stud francais and we need to scrum all day then we'll name the pack to do that and we know what's happening like you you can't go backwards and win games especially at set piece time like your set piece has to be tight so i think that they've maybe taken the eye off the ball or maybe they they earmarked a couple of talented players that really didn't push through into that level that they expected. And now they, they're kind of backtracking. They didn't have the depth. They didn't have a whole bunch of things. Um, so they're going to scramble a little bit. They've got a great squad and a great 23 that can name at any given time. It's really just about tightening up what they have to do. And the lack of competition that has happened throughout, like against the Crusaders and against maybe the South Africans in super rugby has really hurt them a little bit, it seems. And I don't think they're all massively related, like that's all culminated to where we got now. I think that it just so happened that we, that they lost a bit for us leaving super rugby, but then they lost a couple of players and a few goodies and some shit didn't go their way. And it's all now, everyone's just magnifying glass, looking at them going, what the hell is happening? Mm. Yeah. And then, on the other side, like you mentioned earlier, Sean, very interesting changes from the Pumas. Um, so the first one is Eduardo Bello. I think he's protesting the fact that he didn't get to scrum last week. So he's off and uh, Lucio Soldoni is in at tight end. But I think the big one is Marcus Kramer coming into lock. And then uh, Molina's gone to the bench with Lavanini, the the youngster. Um, oh, what's his name? The 20-year-old, the one who was in the under-20s, Elias He's now off the 23. So you have Krem at, the, at lock. You have um, Joaquin Ovedo coming at eight with um, Gonzalez joining the flanks there with Matera. That, yeah, the, with especially with the Kremer thing at lock. I mean, Kremer has played lock internationally. He's obviously a, a very big guy, very physical guy. Obviously, you can see the advantages and disadvantages between the two of having his, you know, mobility and pace around but you might lose something sort of up front yeah i'm not it's a it's an interesting change i i'm not i'm not sure i i i can see the potential i see the good things i'm also a bit worried about it as well yeah it's interesting so i actually don't know much about oviedo have i am i just not thinking properly but anyway he's playing at eight it's going to, I can't remember having watched him play for some bizarre reason, but yeah. I'll probably he's a, he's a very, he's a, he's a, he's, he's a youngster. I think he's 23 now. Um, yeah. I don't think he's, if I'm not mistaken, he's not yet in a like big, like European Is he team. playing out of Argentina? I believe so. No, well, he's oh, yeah, actually, that's no, I'm wrong. He's at Perpignan. Um, uh, so okay. yeah, he's been playing, I guess, with Marvin Ori and Pasola Tuilagi the last few months. Yeah, so like their loose chair, they've changed their loose chair, which I'm I'm quite excited about, but I totally see your concerns. Um, like I, I like that they've changed it. The other big one for me is they brought in Montoya at Hooker to captain the side. Yes. So that is massive, absolutely massive. Crazy. So yeah, this Kramer option at four is 
probably the only one that that I, I kind of recognize that could potentially go wrong. He had that look in his eyes that red cards were coming in the first test. So, you know, maybe maybe I'm just not <laughs> giving the man his dues. But their, their pack looks decent. They've changed. They've moved some stuff around. And they brought in Montoya and they've moved Kramer. And, like, you're looking at that. I bet Scott's looking at that going, what are they bringing? Like that, we are. So, it's so lovely to be in the space where you're like, "What are Argentina cooking?" Where previously you kind of knew what they were going to do, and we would try and do the cooking. Now they're in a position where they can, you know, open the kitchen. So uh, yeah. I'm pumped to see what that what that brings. Yeah, look, that forward battle is going to be massive, and as we talked about, that number four to number seven issue that the All Blacks have. On the other hand, with 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 Argentina, they have some really good players. I mean, if you include Kremer there, you have um, you know, Gonzalez and, and Matera at, at, at the flanks and they're brilliant. You have um Rubiolo who played really well last week. Like that's that's a really solid thing. And then you go to their back line and even especially in that first half, a lot of their tries came from just opportune moments. Like quick turnover ball, they just take advantage of it. We know how good Matera Carreras is, especially when you give him space. Damien uh, McKenzie's ankles can tell you about that as well. And I mean, Lucio Sinti had a good game. We talked about Chocobares on 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 Tuesday as well. Like, you know, yeah, this is. I mean, this is sort of the test for Contemporaries Argentina. Can you back it up? If you can, if these guys can really back this performance up, and then they'll have four wins in a row, including beating France, thrashing basically a first choice Uruguay side. And then beating New Zealand twice in New Zealand, then there's some lights or like it's a red alert for the rest of the rugby world. Like guys, take notice of this team. Massive, and and you say it like that, and I'm getting excited. <laughs> they do, they do have quality on the back line. The thing is that we we've, we've never we haven't forgotten is that they have the ability to fold, but it's something about them now that. Even if they go 10 points down early, there's something about them and those players that you're like, cool, they're actually going to just dig their heels in. They have no problem with doing the shitty work. They have no problem. That pack, as young and as, as exciting as the as the loose trio is, like they don't have a problem with getting stuck in and doing some graft. Mm -hmm. And um, it'll be super exciting. And I think that's possibly why Kramer's been left there even though I moved to four is that could really predict like there's going to be trench warfare the truth is is that's what the all blacks need in order to gain something and then yeah the the it looks like what I was saying about the all blacks of, of past is is kind of true about Argentina now like they've got the pack to do the graft and the work they've got the back line to do the defense but then they've also got that back line they'll be like here's the ball go run and they mm -hmm. flip and do it so yeah, loving it, loving loving that backline. Um, it's unchanged as far as I can see. But yes. since he since he's been decent, Chocobares is an absolute weapon. Um, just it's lovely to see. I think unsung hero from last weekend and someone to really look out for this weekend is Gonzalo Bertrand. He's been he was mm. excellent. So yeah, him and Malia have been good. Their whole backline's been outstanding. Yeah. I would so I'm just looking at the stats from last week. New Zealand kicked 23 times, Argentina's 22. I think if New Zealand's going to win this game, they need to get to 30 kicks. Yeah, like just especially with Will Jordan there. Yeah, they and in, yeah, actually that's a very good point. Now you have about three, four really good kickers on the field. Do the short kicks, do the long kicks, do the up and unders, do the cross field kicks. Like just put them under pressure. Like the one thing that was working for Foster's All Blacks was when they like when that game in New Zealand before the World Cup, they started kicking and the kick chase was amazing. And I think that's kind of why Caleb Clark is in because he's gotten really good at that part of the game. And that's when they could put the Springboks under pressure. New Zealand, is, New Zealand doesn't need to be kicking well. If if it's, if they're not putting like the Carreras and Malias under pressure with that, then there's going to be a problem. Like it needs to be a big territorial game. Yeah, you're right. And I think they need to do some and like some random kicking. As you mentioned, all three of those kicks, like they need to be kicking the RGs to turn them in a in a way that they're not used to going, change it up a little bit, just be spontaneous but planned. Yeah. 
So yeah, I think this will be a big game to I think yeah, it, for all four teams, it's a proven game. It's a very big gut gut test for all the teams. I mean, for the box, that second string side, there's a big gut test for hey, if you can do this away in Australia, like that's gonna put your stocks all the way up for selection. For the wallabies. Yes, they said the right things in, in the media. They haven't really stoked the flames and said we're disrespected. But yeah, this is a bit disrespectful. Like show the Springboks they can't do this against you. And I think for Razors in New Zealand, you can't be losing twice in a row in New Zealand. And for the Pumas, this could be your, hey, we one of the five best teams in the world moment. Absolutely. Well, very well put and I love it. It's The opening weekend, round one, was outstanding. And I think it was outstanding because we wanted to watch the Springboks, but then Argentina delivered what they delivered. This one, round two, is exciting because both games have a lot of have a lot to look out for, and you've nailed it. Yeah. Okay, Sean, I'm not going to make you make predictions because I know you hate that. So, <laughs> <laughs> and we are um, going to end it here. So that is our preview for the week two of the rugby championship. Yeah, please. Obviously, you've got first the New Zealand game this time. You don't have to wake up early for your South African. You've got the Australian South Africa game in the normal time slot. Um, so there's nothing to worry about there. And yeah, please make sure that you do obviously listen to this and yeah, sh um, share this podcast with your other rugby loving friends. Um, follow us on all of our podcast platforms and 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 on the social media platforms as well. And we will see you again for for when we um, review this uh, week of rugby. Bye bye. Bye.